Good morning, Digital Cathedral family. Glad you have you with me once again this morning. And if this is your first time at the cathedral, we give you a special shout out today and we trust that the time that you spend with us is gonna be valuable and you begin to see some things that maybe you never saw before or at least from a perspective that you had not considered. I wanna finish up this morning on what I started last week, which was uh, what is the it in finished? What is the it in finished? So let's go back over to John chapter 19 and let's look at that scripture where Jesus is on the cross and he comes through this and he says it is finished. All right, let's let's pick it up in verse 28. John chapter 19, verse 28. If you have your Bible, I'll be reading this morning, I think exclusively out of the New King James. So uh, you can follow if you would like to. John chapter 19, verse 28. It after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished. That's, that's an important phrase right there that Jesus said. He's actually making a confession. He says, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled. He said, I thirst. Now, actually, that's not a statement of Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled. That's an observation of John. So John walked with Jesus every step of the way through three and a half years of ministry, it brought right down to this point, and John made a declaration that now everything was done. Jesus said in red, I thirst. <clears throat> now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled the sponge with some of the wine, put on the hyssop, and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. Wow, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. You know what? Those three words, it is finished, might just be the biggest, most powerful words of grace. You're talking about grace. It is finished is a grace statement. And we're, we're exploring just how much grace was demonstrated when Jesus said it is finished. Might be the most grace-filled words ever spoken on the planet. Everything was taken care of. Everything was brought to a final conclusion. And the whole process, and this is why I say it was powerful grace, the whole process was grace because we didn't have anything to do with it. There was, there was nothing of man's accomplishment in that. It was a great big present that the Father wrapped up, put a bow on the top, and Jesus completed and said, it is now finished, or as, as verse 28 says, I love John's observation. All things were now accomplished that the scriptures might be fulfilled. All the scriptures. Everything the Father sent Jesus to do, everything the prophets prophesied that Jesus would accomplish. Jesus' own declaration, and we're going to look at some things this morning that were the words of Jesus. Everything that Jesus said about himself was absolutely completed. It is finished. That means it's finalized. It's completed. Nothing can be added. Nothing can be subtracted. It's a, it's a final close, a complete understanding that we have to now grasp to get a full appreciation of what Jesus meant when he said it is finished. Now I'm gonna, uh, last week I gave you two things. I'm gonna try to get three, four, five, six, and seven. I'm gonna try to get five more out today. And these are, these, are not, um, these are not things you've never heard before. But my challenges this morning is that we open up our spirit, allow the mind of Christ to do some unveiling and some revealing as to the depth of what Jesus said he finished. Now we covered two last week. And again, let me just say, you've heard these statements before, but I'm just, I was impressed a couple of weeks ago that I needed to delve into this a little bit and let, let what Jesus did actually fulfilled on my behalf to settle deep within my spirit in a way that it maybe never has before. So last week, uh, we looked at two. We looked at Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. I could probably go another session on, on these two because these are two powerful finishes. So if you're not enjoying the abundant life, Jesus said, I've come that you might have life. It's finished. You got it. You, you have fully the abundant life. Now, if you're not living that life, that's another story. And again, I'm resisting temptation to take off on this. Could it be the reason you're not living the abundant life is because you've been eating at the wrong tree? 
the life that you're now living is a product of the choices and the decisions that basically you made. Now there's some things in life I understand you probably didn't think you had control over when maybe you really do. But let me say this, basically the life I'm living now is the life I decided to live. I'm a product of my choices, my decisions, uh, what I surrounded myself with, how I chose to spend my time. So maybe eating at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil where we made self-determination decisions, we chose what was right, what was wrong, that what we thought was best for our life has led us to a place that that, death, that that tree always produces, which is death. So maybe as we move over to the tree of life, we're going to discover the abundant life that Jesus designed and fully granted to us. Just contemplate. That's what I mean by these things. Take them down another level. Just don't get them at a surface understanding. The other thing we looked at last week was where Jesus said, I've come to seek and to save that which was lost. Didn't make any mention of persons. But what he does make a mention of is anything that has been lost, which could be our identity. Uh, it, could, it could be the result of a lot of our bad decisions. Anything that had a perception of separation from the Father, he now has redeemed and reconciled. The entire cosmos. I've come uh, to seek and to save. That You can't separate those two. Church has separated them. Yeah, I came to seek, but he didn't really save. So don't let anybody separate those two statements in your mind. That is a... That is, Luke 19.10 is well worth spending some time in meditation and contemplation about the packaging of seeking and saving. When the Father sent the Son, I will say this this morning, when the Father sent the Son, neither the Father nor the Son had a low expectation of what the Son would accomplish. They looked at the world and they declared, we love the world so much that the Father's going to send the Son and the Son willingly willingly claim. Their vision was the world. John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So they worked. I want you to see that the father and the son worked in harmony to bring to completion these finished. All of the it's are finished. You can't add another stroke to the masterpiece. When you read your Bible, I want you to look at it through the lens of it is finished. And when you see some things that are declared completed or accomplished, finished. I want you to just take those and embrace them into yourself and say, Father, I thank you that now this is something that I can actually live out, that I can, that I can come in, into a place where I can have the abundant life. I'm eating at the right tree now. I understand you, you sought me and saved me. Uh, I, I've had a sense of lostness in my mind. I was separated in my mind. You took care of that. So whenever you, whenever you see these things in Scripture, and that's why I'm pointing out, I want to get through seven if I can this morning. First two we hit last week. And number three is this. This is an observation again of John. First John chapter three. First John chapter three. And I'm just going to read one verse. Powerful, powerful declaration, powerful observation of John. John chapter three, verse eight says this. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sin, sinned from the beginning. Now, however, whatever you, whatever you uh, feel the devil is, if you still got no religious perception, he's just got to run around in a red suit and, a, you know, pointed ears and a tail and a pitchfork, that's fine. If you feel that it's a mental thing, you know, I, I tend to gravitate toward the losses we had in our mind created, but I, that's for another day. He who sins is of the devil. Who Sin means you miss the mark. You don't know your identity. Those that don't walk in identity. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested. Right. So here, here's a finish. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. The only question is, the only question on any of these it's is, did he accomplish them? Oh, my phone just went off. Must be God calling. Let me just power this off. So the only question we have on the it's, excuse me. The only, the only question we have on the it's is, did he fully complete them? Was he successful in his mission? So when John says, for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy, notice the works. I'm just going to wrestle with the works for a minute. Anything you attribute which comes from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, 
Anything that comes as a result of eating at that tree, he has destroyed and cleared the way for you to walk over to the right tree. Did he accomplish that? Did he fulfill it? Well, Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2 and, and verse 5 says, says this. Colossians chapter 2 and, and uh, verse 5. I'm sorry, verse 15. Colossians chapter 2 verse 15. <laughs> Big difference in the verses. Having disarmed principalities and powers, having, so he dealt with the works, 1 John 3, 8. He destroyed the works. And now he's going after the root cross. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. So not only were the works destroyed, but the cause, the origination of the works that has created a scenario where we don't enjoy the abundant life, he took care and destroyed all of that. So let me ask you this, if that's true, why have we empowered whatever we feel the devil is? Why have we empowered that force so much? Why have we given, evidently, power to that which has no power? I wrestle with that. I really wrestle with that because the devil has, has had, he's been magnanimous to say the least in most church circles. And if Jesus said, John said he came to destroy the works and then he turns around Colossians and said, not only to destroy the works, he took care of the principality, the origination itself. So why, why, why do we empower the devil? The devil should not have any power. Let me, let me throw this out there. Get a vision. That's why I said, I want you to take these down to maybe some new revelation. If the entire world ate at the tree of life, would we see evil? Absolutely not. The tree of life is a responding to what the Father has spoken to us. So the whole world has empowered that which has no power. And what's going on today, and it's, it's arising because of this great tsunami that's covering the planet, <clears throat> is a reversal of what the world has bought into. And at some point, it's going to reach a tipping point. See, the kingdom has come. The will of God is being done on the earth exactly the way it is in heaven. We're seeing emerging of the two kingdoms. So the things that we're laying out here in this teaching, and again, I say, you've heard all this. You've heard these things, but I want you to see them at a new level, at a new depth. And if we don't believe that he has destroyed the works of the devil, if we don't believe that he made a show of principalities and powers openly, defeating them in it, then what we're in essence saying is that Jesus did not fulfill his mission. It is not finished. That's been the position of most churches that I've ever been involved with. Any education that I've ever received, any degree I've ever been granted, comes with the background, really, that Jesus did not finish it. He, yeah, he gave us an abundant life, but I've got to do something. I have to, I have to pray to get it. I have to ask the sky God to impart it to me. Yeah, he came to seek, but I have to make sure that I get myself saved and witness to other people, make sure they're saved. I can't go with them to them with the good news that he's already reconciled us, that he's already saved us, and now open your eyes and awaken to the truth. See, that's the gospel. That's good news. Yeah, Jesus, Jesus didn't, I mean, yeah, G okay, Jesus defeated the devil, but you and I, poor, poor old little Jesus, he, he, he couldn't finish the job by himself. We have, to, we have to wrestle, we have to fight, we have to war to finish the job off. You know what Paul would call that? He'd call that another gospel. He'd call that another Jesus. You know how you can recognize another Jesus? And this morning, while I'm teaching you at the Digital Cathedral, there are people filling the buildings all over the land that are adhering to another Jesus and following another gospel. You know what another Jesus essentially is? Another Jesus is a Jesus who did not single-handedly finish entirely what he came to accomplish. We read in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 to 20, Jesus said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and in earth. It's been given to me. Now, if, if it all has been given to him, how much does that leave for any other entity or any other force? Zero. No other power has any. It's zero with the rim knocked off. Then he turns around and says, all right, now, guys, I want you to go. And I want you to teach them everything that I've taught you. 
which is what I'm doing this morning. I'm teaching you everything that Jesus has taught me. I do that every week. Whatever he imparts to me, I impart to you. And the time that you have during the week, he's imparting things to you that you can begin to impart back. And through your comments, listen, I enjoy your comments. You impart to me. I learned from you. I have learned a lot from the people that attend the Digital Cathedral and the Secret Place on Wednesday night. I, I believe in a great big Jesus. I, I, I believe there is a huge it of grace that benefits us when Jesus said it is finished because all of these things were done by him single-handedly and now he's presented them and handed them over to us. All, the, all, the, all authority, Jesus said, has been given to him. Now here, you go and you do likewise, which is going to bring me up to the next finished, which is a very practical one. See, as a grace culture, we need to impart these things to our world, to our community. All right, let's look at number four, Luke chapter four. Luke chapter four, this is one of my favorite little passages in all of scripture. And Jesus, these are the words of Jesus, and he proclaimed something here that I want you to notice. And then I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of shift this to where it's very practical for us. Luke 4, 18. You've heard this. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, set at liberty those that are oppressed, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant, sat down. The eyes of everybody in the church house was on Jesus, and he began to say to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. It's finished. Now th these, there's what, what I count off, six things on my finger that Jesus said, okay, here's what I, here's what I am here to do. And I think that's part of what the Matthew chapter 28, when he said, all authority has been given to me, all authority to do everything we just read in Luke chapter four, verse 18. Now that's actually a direct quote from the Old Testament, but if you go back to the quote from the Old Testament, Jesus lives, leaves out one little part, the day of vengeance of our God. He totally annihilated that one, left it out, didn't quote it. But he did list six, five, six, seven things there that he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to do this. Spirit of the Lord is upon you, look me in the eye. Spirit of the Lord is upon you this morning for you to do the exact same things. It's finished. He said, this day the scripture is fulfilled in your ears. So a grace culture, which we're developing here at the Digital Cathedral, will impart these to other people. If our city should know anything about us, look, we gather in, we don't have a building, we don't have an organization, we don't have a government. We gather in to learn on Sunday morning. And what we learned here, we take back out into, into our world. If When we go back out into the world from the digital cathedral, if the world should see anything from us, it should be this message, it's finished, it's completed. And where we see the brokenhearted, we heal it. Where we see the blind, spiritually blind, physically blind, we restore sight. We proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. That's the abundant life that Jesus came to give us. What, what we're experiencing now is an outworking of another scripture. I always looked at this scripture in days gone by before I really began to understand grace as being futuristic, but these verses are not futuristic. Acts chapter three. See, Jesus said, these things are finished. And now let me, let me just put a little bit of boots on the ground because I want you to understand what's, what's going on in your world and in your life. Acts chapter three and verse 20. Acts chapter three, verse 20. And that Jesus, and that he may send Jesus, who was preached to you before, whom the heavens must receive until the time of the restoration of all things. Luke chapter 4, verse 18, I'm, I, I'm contending is a restoration. The things that you're restoring back to people are things that belong to them, things that were included in the it is finished, but they're blind to it. They're not awakened to it. They've never seen it. There's a veil over their eyes. They've sat in a church all of their life and nobody has ever explained to them what was finished and that it now belongs to them and they can receive it, they can impart it, they can carry it. Whew. I love this. The heavens must re receive until 
the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets. Everything that the prophet proclaimed about the coming Jesus, about the coming Messiah, he said it's finished, it's fulfilled. John, John looked at it and said, everything in the scripture, every I dotted, every T cross, it's done, it's history, it's taken care of. I, that, that's a great scripture. So this, this is the outworking of the favor that God has given to you. Now do you understand why I'm saying you need to take these it's in finished and just take them down deeper. Begin to explore them. Let them become part of your life, living and part of your expression. Right? This, this is the outworking of favor that we all can experience. The only reason people don't aren't experiencing because they they have not recovered their identity yet. They're still they're still lost. You know what the loss is? Lost identity, not understanding who you are. Every year to finish is a grace gift. All these things in Luke four eighteen, they're grace gifts that have been imparted. The abundant life, the seeking and saving the lost, the destruction of the works and the principality behind the works is destroyed. I've discovered something, and I bet many of you have also, and that is this, the more radical my grace gets, the more pure it gets, the more I come out of the last little tentacles trying to hang on to me, the bigger I see Jesus. The more sovereign I see the Father and the outworking of his plan and his will upon the earth. All of the it's is finished in the heart of the Father, and now the heart of the Father is being exposed to us so that we can know he's taking care of everything. All right, let's go another one. Luke chapter Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23. This is Jesus again speaking. Luke chapter 23. Hope you're getting a whole lot out of this. I just about have preached myself happy this morning. I'll tell you for sure, this stuff lights me up. You know what happens? I think about this stuff all week long. And because I think about it all week long, I come over here and I'm like, I'm like a can of Coke that you shake up and then you pop the top. It just explodes. And I want you to explode with the same things. Because this is, I'm, I'm giving you all good news this morning. There's no bad news in what I'm teaching you today. Luke chapter 23, verse 34. Luke chapter 23, verse, I'm in chapter 24. I'm getting so excited I get to the wrong chapters. 23, 34. Jesus said this, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Do you think when Jesus said, Father, forgive them, do you think the Father go, no, I don't think so. Not today. No, not today. When Jesus said, Father, forgive them, finished. Forgiveness was totally finished. That, that is a, that's a, I want you to notice, that's a declaration Jesus made. That wasn't some kind of invitation to come receive your forgiveness. I know what they told you. That's not an invitation come down. And if you ask for forgiveness, he will give it to you. No, it's a declaration. It's forgiven. The word forgive there is the Greek word aphiemi. Aphiemi. There you go. Aphiemi. And it means to omit, discard, let go of, send away. It's often used in terms of forgiving a debt. So when he said forgive their sins, he's saying omit them, disregard them, uh, let go of them, throw them in the deepest part of the sea. The question is, who's the them? Was it just the soldiers that nailed him to a cross? He's saying, Father, just forgive these guys for driving those nails in my hands. Or was he talking about the priest that charged him or the thief that uh, kind of chided him? Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Uh, maybe some about those that deserted him, all the, the, the disciples ran away. Maybe he's going to forgive those that just stood down at the foot of the cross and watched the whole thing going on and didn't protest. Now, I want to suggest to you that Father Forgive Them ripples back through history all the way through the eons of time into the future. He has forgiven. He has omitted, disregarded, done away with, let go of, sent away. He's forgiven the mortgage. He's, he's forgiven the debt. He's forgiven the mortgage on your spiritual house. You, you can't send another payment into the bank. They won't receive it. You can bawl and squall and ask God to forgive you all you want down the altar. And God's just saying, son, why, why are you going through this? Jesus said, Father, forgive him. At that point, it was done. No further payments can be made. 
Didn't Paul? Paul got it. Paul's the one that said that God was in Christ reconciling the world to, him, world to himself. Watch. Not imputing their trespass. Imputing is an accounting term. Adding up. Not imputing their trespasses against them. That's the way Jesus rolled. He has to. Because he's the one that taught us on the Sermon on the Mount to forgive our enemies. How, how could he demand that level of forgiveness and perfection in us? And yet, those that have not prayed the magic prayer, when they die, he's going to throw them into a customized torture chamber? For that argument that's, no, he's not going to do it. You, you're doing it yourself. Ain't nobody going to throw themselves into a fiery pit if you believe in that. What happened to your free will? Did it, did it end at death? That's crazy. All right, number, number six. Number six. Luke chapter 10. This is, this is really important. Luke chapter 10. Matthew, Mark, Luke chapter 10. I want to read one scripture that Jesus said in Luke chapter 10. Let me just get over here. These, these are some heavy revies this morning. It, it, like I say, I know you've heard it, but I'm, I'm pushing you. I'm pushing it down a little farther. I'm, I'm putting the pedal to the metal on some of this because it has to become real to us before we can share it. If you have any doubt, if you have any doubt that he did not come to give you an abundant life, that he didn't seek and save you, it was all his part. If you don't have the assurance that the devil's defeat, you still think there's all this evil out there that has all the power, right? If, if every one of these seven that I'm trying to get to this morning, they have got to become bone of your bone, flesh of your flesh, part of your DNA. Luke chapter 10 and verse 22. Jesus said, all things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son. Now, there's a, there's a powerful two-way statement here. Nobody knows the Son in entirety except the Father. And nobody knows the Father. Nobody knows the Father. Nobody has seen the Father. Nobody has a good recollection. Nobody's had an encounter. In fact, they didn't even call him Father except the Son. It is finished. It is finished. Jesus came to show us the Father. Now, I'm just going to clear all the clutter out of your mind, if you have any, of every other source that has tried to tell you what God is. I don't care if it's your church, your pastor, denomination, seminary professors. It's obvious from those verses that the father had been the victim of a lot of bad PR in a lot of different places. The prophets that wrote the Old Testament, they saw through a glass darkly. That, that was a hard thing for me to come to confess because I, I cut my teeth on the inerrancy of Scripture. So I'd always try to balance Old Testament. God's declaring that uh, cities ought to be destroyed and all that kind of stuff. And then over here, you, you got the unconditional love of God with no conditions on it, and he's a good, good, good father getting gooder all the time and, and trying to weigh this out and explain it. You can't explain it. Stop trying. You can't explain it. The prophets that wrote the Old Testament had good hearts. They were writing from their perspective. And oftentimes, I mean, even today, oftentimes when things don't happen, people say, well, it must be God. It's If, if, you're, a, if you're a believer when things happen, it's the devil's after me. If you look at an unbeliever and the same things happen to him, well, God's trying to teach him a lesson. No, God doesn't use that. Oftentimes when things happen, even insurance companies today, say, call tornadoes, hurricanes, uh, catastrophes, disasters, acts of God. That shows you how deep the perversion is. If we, if we would have um, had a perfect Old Testament reflection of of, of the Father, Jesus could never have said nobody's seen the Father but me. He would have said, had to say, look, the Old Testament prophets and, and all the writers of the Old Testament, they saw him, and, and I'm just giving you my perspective. No, nobody, he said nobody's seen him but the Son. Remember on the Mount of Transfiguration, there's Moses, the prophets, Moses representing the law, and there's Jesus. And the Father looks and says, that's my, that's my boy right there. That's Jesus. Hear him. Didn't say hear the prophets. Didn't say hear the law said, hear my son, hear Jesus. Let me put it like this. Jesus 
was the father wearing a earth suit. Jesus was the father wearing an earth suit. In this one man, this one man, God and man met. It's called the hypostatic union. Jesus was 100% God, 100% man, all at the same time. Now, I want, I want, dare I say, the hypostatic union has been extended to you. You are a new creation in Christ. Old things passed away. Your species of being the planet's never seen before. You are 100% God, 100% man. God is 100% God. You're not. You're 100% man, 100% God. Right? And, and when covenant was made, it was made in Jesus and humanity was represented in Jesus and the Father was represented in Jesus. You didn't make covenant with God. You would never kept it. You haven't kept it. The covenant was made on your behalf by your older brother Jesus. So there's a lot of things that are portrayed in the Old Testament by the prophets that verse 24 are saying they're inaccurate. I came to clear the picture up. That is such a powerful revelation. Jesus came to show us to ourselves, who we've always been, didn't know it, and came to show us and clear up every wrong perception of the Father. The Father said, look, I, I'm going to come myself and show you who I am. So when he shows up on the scenes, the Father in essence is saying, hey guys, this is me. This is how I look. This is how I act. This is my character. This is how I treat those that despitefully use me. This is, this is what I say to those that have sinned. And Jesus exposes it all on the Sermon on the Mount. So if you're going to try to take a view of God out of the Old Testament and try to balance it with what Jesus revealed in the New Testament, I can tell you right now, you're going to be double-minded. You're never going to feel secure in your relationship to the Father. The only way that I know that you can feel secure in Him is if you learn to rest back into His arms, receive the picture that Jesus revealed to us in any other picture, any other thought that comes, anything else you read, I don't care where you read it, in a book that's printed or in the Bible itself, reject it and say, that's just not right. That's wrong. It's okay to say there are things written about my father that are not right, that are not accurate. Maybe the writer was sincere in what they were writing and what they reported, but they're not accurate. I don't have to receive them. So one of the it's, it, it is finished, was the completed mission of Jesus to absolutely show us implicitly who the Father is. Let me give you two verses just so you know I'm legal on this. John chapter 14. John chapter 14, and let me read just verse 7. If you have known me, you would have known my Father also. Now, powerful statement here. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Why? Because you've seen me. And he goes on to tell Philip, Dude, have I been so long with you and you have known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Anybody trying to show you the Father today that is apart from Jesus is on the wrong track. Period, paragraph, end of story. All right, one more. Writer of Hebrews, chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. Oh boy, I'm probably getting some, some raised eyebrows today just going through some things that you've heard before, but brother, we're, we're, we're putting it down there. Hebrews chapter 1. God who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the Father in times past by the prophets has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, including you. He's an heir, heir of all things. You're a joint heir with him. He's got you covered. Through whom also he has made the worlds. Verse 3, speaking about Jesus, who being the brightness of God's glory. Oh, aren't you glad that Jesus prayed, Father, the glory you've given me, give them to. You are shining today with the glory of God. Turn it loose. Accept it. Believe it. That's why I'm doing this little... What is the it's a finish? The glory of God has been displayed within you, and now we're learning how to turn it loose. The brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. Express image, exact, Xerox copy. Can't tell one from the other. Father saying through the Son, it's finished. 
Father through the Son is revealing how much he loves us, how much he cares for us, how much he has given us security. He's saying, I'd rather come and die at the hands of angry, vindictive, religious people. Don't forget that religion is the one that nailed Jesus to the tree. The Father did not kill Jesus. Instead of you. He loved you so much that he sent the Son and sacrificed at the hands of wicked people. And God wasn't off in yonder somewhere. God was in Christ every step of the way, demonstrating that pure, absolute love. And that's what reconciled the world to himself, broke down every barrier that man should carry in his mind. What, what we're carrying today that is a distorted view of God is fluff, it's floss, it's dust, it's garbage, and it needs to be cleared out. So whatever you have been led to think about the Father that doesn't look like Jesus, chuck it. Chuck it. Whatever you read that doesn't line up with what Jesus looks like, get rid of it. Get rid it's finished. The full revelation and disclosure of the Father is totally finished. I tell you, it's mornings like this that I really miss being behind a pulpit where I can walk around and I'm, I got, man, I'm feeling so much inside on this today that is, that is truth that we, we can now impart. All right, number seven, last one. John chapter three. John chapter three. One verse. John chapter three. <laughs> And religion has tried to explain this away so much. John chapter 3, verse 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now, if you do a little, just a little bit of research, you'll find that word might was never in the original. It was placed in there to, to give, I guess to give, religion opportunity to say well he might but doesn't mean he will no so that the world through him the actual word that should be there is would check it out so that through him the world would be saved no question about it no question about it. mission accomplished it's finished it's done it's history it's taken care of john got it first john chapter 4 1 John chapter 4. See, that John, John had some, some tremendous insights on things that he wrote that maybe some of the other ones didn't. Uh, Big John, just ba back it up. John chapter 4 and verse 42. We looked at John 3.17. Look at John chapter 4 verse 42. Then they said to the woman, Now we believe, not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him and we know. I like that word no means intimacy knowing it's not an intellectual understanding that this is indeed the Christ the Savior of the world first John chapter 4 verse 14 John was so fired up with it he said it again John chapter 4 verse 14 and we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son as the Savior of the world mission accomplished it's finished it has been done Jesus said the, the it in finish takes in the fact the death, the resurrection, the death, the burial, the resurrection of all of humanity into newness of life. 2 Corinthians 5.14, if one died for all, all died. I, I don't know about you, but I died in my death with Jesus. It's a point that a man wants to die. I died in my death. I'm not dying anymore. Not dying anymore. The Father sent the Son and both through no less than embracing and loving the entire world, saved the world, All right? See, it really bugs me now that God, the idea that God somehow birthed humanity with the idea that you're going to save some, save a few, 10, 15% of us are going to make it, the rest aren't going to make it. That's, that's not what... what your book says, John chapter 6, I know I'm doing a lot of scripture this morning. You know why I, do, why I take time and go to this in my Bible and read the scripture? It's because, I don't know if you know it or not, I want to equip you so that as you talk to your friends whose eyes are beginning to open, your know, eyes open a little bit at a time. So I, I want to begin to just help you have a basis and a foundation sometimes. If you take these scriptures down and meditate and think about them, 
until that word becomes your flesh, then you can, like a can of preserves, you can open it up and serve it anytime. All right, John chapter 6. John chapter 6 and verse 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. That word draws the word helco. It's a weak word. It actually means, <laughs> it, you know what it actually means? It means to drag by power. When, when the fishermen threw out the nets and they were full of fish and the scriptures they, that they dragged the, the, the nets back to the boat, the word's helco, same word, absolutely. I'm so glad this morning that Jesus did not say, I am finished. I'm so glad Jesus didn't say, I've done my part, I've done 95%, now you got to do the other 5%. When Jesus said, it is finished, it was, it was a powerful grace statement. Everything that it is finished involves and includes, you didn't have anything to do with. They're impartations, direct deposits that he has made into your life. There's no part that I can play into this. The only thing I can do is raise up my hand and say, Father, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I'm seeing more and more, Father, what you have given to me, right? You don't have to do your part. There's no part. What, what part are you going to put into it is finished? Last week I said for you thinking you have to do something, pray a prayer, get water baptized, pay your tithe, be diligent, be fair. It's like Rembrandt painting a masterpiece and saying, there it is. My painting's done. You say, no, wait a minute. And you dipping a, a, a brush in and going, it needs one more stroke. And you trying to finish what Rembrandt looked back and said, it is finished. When Jesus said, it is finished, every it, every mission, every assignment, every directive that only he and he alone could fulfill got completed. Everything John said that was spoken of in the scripture has been fulfilled. Every it was a grace wrapped direct deposit to every member of the human race. Nobody was left out. Nobody was left out. You know that, it, uh, I can't, I, I'm, my time is up. I can't get into it. But I, I'm in one of these times, I want to unwind John chapter 3, 16, 17, 18, 19. Because religion has used that to say, yeah, that we might not be perishing, that we won't be condemned. I'm going to unwind that for you. I, I, maybe I should. I should let you think about it. I should let you think about it in terms of what I've taught you today. Can you believe today that it's been totally finished for you? That's my huge question today. I did all this, laid it out for two reasons. One, so that you could become totally convinced that every it is yours. It's finished for you. Second of all, so that you could let it become part of your life so that you could dispense it. Body of Christ, the world is waking up. As we move into the Grace Awakening Network that's going to launch March 1st, uh, it's going to be reaching people. And you're part of everything I, everything I do, you're part of. Thank you for those of you that support me. You're not many, but you're mighty. Thank you for those that support me and help me. When Jesus said, if one died, or Paul said, one died for all, all died. Every teaching that I do, every, every place that I go, you go with me. Without you, I, can't, I couldn't be doing it. So in effect, we're in union together on this mission. I did it so that I taught last week and this week some familiar sayings because I want you to embrace it and know it. First of all, it's for you, and I want you to be able to then give it to people. This thing is going to grow exponentially. There's no question about it. And you, we're just equipping. We're being equipped that we can bring a unity of the faith to people that are, in fact, coming alive to the things of God. Right? So as you begin to walk in a day of fullness, of the completion of it is finished. The revelation is going to be more and more and more. This is no boring journey. This is no dry trip. This is an adventure that is exciting. I'm more excited about the gospel, the good news, what God's doing than I've ever been in my life. The Holy Spirit is the only one. He's our best friend. Best friend. Holy Spirit is the only one that can open your eyes and transform your life and teach you the depths of it is finished. And he's faithful to do it. Thank you so much for being with me this morning. God bless every one of you. 
So many of you are faithful in your attendance and you come to the Wednesday night Facebook Live, uh, which I call the secret place, Wednesday night, seven, uh, 6 p.m. Central, it'll be 7 p.m. Eastern time. Thank you for being with me both times and for your prayers, just your encouragement. I love your comments. Uh, thank you for the sacrifices you make to help this ministry continue. God bless you. We'll see you next time at The Secret Place and we'll continue our journey together. God bless. If your heart has been touched by Don Keithley's words and you believe this ministry can enrich your spiritual journey, we warmly invite you to subscribe and hit the bell icon. By doing so, you'll stay up to date with all the new and inspiring content from the Digital Cathedral, ensuring you never miss out on the transformative power of God's love and grace. You may make a donation at donkeithley.com. We thank you for your continued support and encouragement.